in the next 50 years, we're going to have to increase food production by 100% in order to feel, feed the world. So what's the solution for these biotechnophobes? How will we, uh, how will we um, increase food production by 100% without biotechnological innovation? So Margaret, I'm sure this keeps you up at night, right? I mean, you, you're dealing with this already. Well, our position is that biotechnology is a, a critical component of a new system that, w that we need to raise production. Um, we also need a lot of other things. Um, you know, we need to develop cooperatives that can um, pool their resources to access credit, to buy more inputs. Um, we need better extension. We need, um, we need stability, government stability. Um, all of those things, and and I, I do think that the more you can get stories from the field that are successful examples of, of very um, multiple partnerships between governments, um, international NGOs and local NGOs, um, credit institutions, and private sector technology, those kinds of, of stories, we need to be really, really working on getting that message out and telling that's how, this is how it's going to work. And it's going to be a menu of options. It's not going to be a single recipe. It's going to be um, sometimes country specific and situation specific. And, and that's what we have to lift up as a vision. And I am amazed, amazed by the virulence of the opposition to genetic engineered products and the clinging to organics. And when I talk to people, what do they say? Why do they hate genetically engineered foods? They think that there's too much pesticide. They don't like monoculture. They don't like seed companies having monopolies on seeds. And those are all issues that are legitimate. They have nothing to do with genetic engineering seeds. They have nothing to do with science. They are, somehow, they have been conflated. The message that I'd like to get out more is that it's, it, is, it is a tool and a very powerful tool. It's not a belief system. Genetic engineering has many contexts in which it can be used. It needs to be locally adapted. It's going to be different in the U.S. and it's going to be different in Africa. Local stakeholder involvement is key. And engaging readers in kind of a more nuanced discussion about this, that valuing valid fears, trying to diminish the complete factual errors, that's, I mean, it's going to take a lot of work. Well, I think another thing we haven't had until now is 15 years of experience to have the environmental data and to see, you know, this experiment might not have turned out this way. And so 50 years ago, when people were concerned, they might have had a pretty good reason. It was, it was a new technology. We thought we understood things, but we've been wrong before. As scientists, we need to do a much better job. I wish I could get a lot of my colleagues to be more forthcoming and, and to spend more time speaking to the public about it. I think we can help journalists do a better job. But I think all of us who do understand the science need to make it part of our daily life to be communicating it, because people are, by and large, reasonable when they can see some tangible results, and when they see that something's okay, then we'll get on an airplane and fly, they will get in a car and drive, they might even use electricity, and they'll certainly accept, you know, Part of the reason they do that is there's some...